take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. I encourage you to take your Bibles and open to the Gospel of Mark this morning. The Gospel of Mark chapter 14 is where we're going to be reading from this morning. Mark chapter 14 verses 1 to 9. And would you stand for the reading of Scripture this morning, please? Mark chapter 14 verses 1 to 9. After two days was the feast of the Passover and of the unleavened bread... And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do to them good. But me ye have not always. She has done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. And verily I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached, or excuse me, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Thank God for his infallible, inspired word. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray for the illumination of the Holy Spirit to help us see uh, the meaning of this passage and the beauty of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Believers are those who simply love Christ. If you want to know what a believer is, that's it. The Bible characterizes true believers as simply those that Uh, as I've said before, see the beauty of Christ, and they love Christ. They've had their spiritual eyes open to see who he is. They see Jesus through the pages of Scripture. This is how we see Christ, the glory of Christ, through the Word of God. And having seen Christ, they love him. The Bible says in John 16, 27, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. You believe who I am, who I say I am, that I came from God, Jesus says, and you have loved me. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, we love him because he first loved us. That's what a believer is. We see that Christ is the greatest gift that God has ever given this world. The Bible says, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift, that is to say, inexpressible gift, It is beyond words. Paul said this in uh, 2 Corinthians 1, For the Son of God, Jesus, whom we proclaim among you, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. This is why through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. What is Paul saying here? All the promises of God are bound up in Christ. And he is the yes of the promises of God. And that's why we treasure Christ. He is the source of our blessing. And the Bible says that God has opened our eyes to see him. This is the reason why, as Christians, we don't faint in this world. Things can get difficult. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.1, we faint not. We don't quit. Why? Well, because we've seen the glory and the beauty of Christ, and we love Christ. And the Bible says it's the love of Christ that constrains us, that controls us. That's why we continue on. Not everyone has seen Jesus for who he is. Not everyone has seen the beauty of Christ. Why not? 
Well, because the Bible says the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. They can't see the beauty of Christ. They can't see the glory of Christ. That's why not everyone loves Christ. God has to be the one that opens our eyes to see who Jesus is. Well, how does one know whether or not their eyes have been opened to see the beauty of Christ? Well, that's what this story here in John 14 shows me. Or excuse me, Mark 14. Mark is the longest chapter in the gospel of Mark. And it focuses on what theologians call the passion of Christ. The word passion from the Latin, which simply means suffering. And here we see a woman who sees Jesus for who he is, who sees him as the Son of God, the Savior who is the one who would die for sins, and she does this incredible act of devotion and worship that shows her love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to see the structure of this narrative. In Mark chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, we have the chief priests and scribes, the religious leaders, they're plotting to kill Jesus. And then you drop down to verses 10 and 11, and you see Judas plotting to betray Jesus. So in this narrative, what you have is kind of a bookend. You have at the beginning of the chapter, people hating Christ, trying to kill him. You have in verses 10 and 11, Judas hating Christ, wanting to betray him. But right in the middle, sandwiched in between that, is a story of this woman's love and devotion. It stands in stark contrast to the evil plotting against Christ because they did not love him. They hated him. By the way, we see this same contrast today. The world still hates Christ. The world still despises him. They're still plotting to destroy him, while true believers treasure him. True believers honor him and worship him and love him. And Mark wants us to see this contrast. That's why he puts this narrative right in between these two bookends of these plots against Jesus. In fact, this whole story is not chronological. If you you read Mark, you might think that this is happening right uh, on the eve of the Passover. It's not. This story is actually a flashback, and Mark kind of inserts it right here in this narrative. He actually is going back to six days before the Passover, which would put this whole event on the Friday right before Jesus rode in on Palm Sunday. And so this is the Friday before the triumphal entry. Why does Mark place it here? Why does he slip this narrative in here? And again, this is, this is on purpose for him because he wants us to see the contrast. He's contrasting the ugliness of those who hate Christ with the beauty of those who treasure him, who love him. It's kind of a window of love on a wall of hate, we could say. And this woman is an example for all of us. God exalts her. Jesus says what she did will be remembered. And again, look in verse number 9. Verily I say unto you that... Uh, wheresoever the whole gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial. She will be an example to all. She will be remembered because of this act, because she honored and she treasured Christ above all. So I want you to see four characteristics of someone who treasures Christ. I would ask you this morning, do you love Christ? Do you treasure him? Well, how do I know? Well, Let's look at this story. Number one, when Christ, we, we treasure Christ above all when Christ is the central person of our life. Look in verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat. So where is this? This is in Bethany. This is just outside of Jerusalem. This was, uh, again, on the Friday before Palm Sunday. He was invited to the home of Simon the leper. Now, who was Simon? There's been a lot of speculation about him, but the most plausible is that He was a man simply that Jesus healed of leprosy. I mean, you wouldn't go to a dinner with someone who still had leprosy, right? Simon the leper. That would be like someone having COVID-19 and saying, look, I just tested positive, but I'm having a dinner party. Would you like to come? You wouldn't do that. A person wouldn't go to a house of someone who had leprosy. So when it says Simon the leper, obviously he was healed or he wouldn't be able to have a dinner party because leopards were social outcasts that were not allowed any close interaction with other people, according to Leviticus chapter 13. And by the way, leprosy was an incurable disease in the ancient world. So how did this man get cured? This was man who was healed by Jesus. 
Jesus healed them. Jesus healed hundreds of lepers. And so this was Simon's way of showing his gratitude. You might call this a Thanksgiving dinner. In the parallel account in John chapter 12, John tells us who was at this dinner. Lazarus was there, the one that Jesus had resurrected in John 11. There was also Mary and Martha, his sisters. There were all the disciples that were there. And some of the important people in the community were there. This is a wonderful gathering here on the Friday before the triumphal entry. And then look at verse 3 where it says, And he sat at meat. The word here for sat is a word that actually means to lie down. We could say it recline. Because in this culture, you didn't sit at a chair at a table like we do today. One would recline on their elbow, and there would be a small short table there in front of you. Which is why, by the way, foot washing was so vital for guests. When you recline, you didn't want to recline into someone's dirty feet that was next to you, right? So when a person was invited to a dinner party, there would always be a servant there that would wash the feet of the guests when they came in. And also, another custom was they would anoint the head of their guest with oil. What was this oil? This oil was really a perfume or a cologne. And it released a sweet-smelling aroma, a sweet smell. You have to remember that people in this day didn't have access to showers and baths frequently like we do. It was a hot climate. So you can imagine what it was like when you get a lot of people together who were in a room that had just walked a long distance in the heat on a dusty road to get there. It was necessary when they got there to wash their feet and to anoint them with this perfume. And this, would, this odor would serve to cover up other odors, body odor, That was there. But this was a tradition to wash the feet, to anoint with oil. It was also a way of showing honor to the guests. And the greater the guests, the greater the anointing. Remember, David said in Psalm 23 about God, Thou anointest my head with oil. So here is Jesus. He is reclining at the table. This was at the meal. And then suddenly something happens in verse. Three, it says, and as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she break the box and poured it on his head. While he's reclining at the table, suddenly this woman comes in. And by the way, this was a breach of protocol, Jewish protocol. You, as a woman in that day, you couldn't just interrupt a dinner party of men, but... You could only do that if you're serving something. But here, she doesn't care about Jewish protocol. She doesn't care about what the custom is. She doesn't care about what people think. She's not concerned with any of the other guests that are there. She's only concerned about Christ. She recognized Jesus as the most important person in that place. Her whole focus is on honoring Christ. Christ. He's the most important guest. He's the most important person. He is the preeminent one. And by doing this, this woman really is demonstrating what Paul said in Colossians 1.18, that, that he might have the preeminence. In all things, he might have the preeminence. You see, we treasure and love Christ when Christ is the most important person in our life. Can that be said of you? And by the way, this woman, she's nameless here in Mark. But in the parallel account in John's Gospel, she's given a name. Her name is Mary. She is, again, the sister of Lazarus. Every time we see Mary in the Gospels, three times, by the way, we see her. Each time she's at the feet of Jesus, she's had close fellowship with him. She would listen to his every word. She adored him. She was amazed by him. She was captivated by Christ. And her knowledge of Jesus, her association with Jesus was the greatest thing that had ever happened to her. And she demonstrates that. Again, I ask, how about you? Is your knowledge of him the greatest thing that has ever happened to you? Is he the biggest factor in your life? Is he the biggest influence in your life? Are you more proud of your association with Christ than in any other thing? There's a lot of things in this life that we can be proud of, and rightfully so. The Bible doesn't uh, condemn that. It's perfectly legitimate. But are you more proud of your association with Jesus than anything else? Is he the central person in your life? It it was for Mary. 
You treasure Christ above all when He is the central person of your life. But number two, when we cherish His redemptive work. Now, why this anointing? What was this all about? Why did she do this? She was looking forward to His sacrificial work. Look down in verse number 8, where Jesus says, She has done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the, what? To the burying. She knew what was going to happen. She knew that Christ was going to die, and she knew that he was going to be buried, and I believe she knew that he was going to be resurrected. And here in this house of Simon the leper, she expresses her love to Christ for what he was about to do, not only for her, but also for the sins of all the world. He was about to die. Not everybody there got that. Not everybody really understood what Jesus was about to do and why he was about to do it. She got it. She understood. By the way, people today, they still don't understand why Jesus died. They still don't contemplate why we cherish the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. They just don't get it. There's a popular view among critical scholars today that teaches that Jesus died as a failed prophet. His mission was to bring the kingdom, and that failed, and his death on the cross ended that failed mission. This was a theory that was uh, brought into being by a German scholar named Albert Schweitzer. But Mary, when she anointed Jesus this day, was showing that Jesus, his death was not a defeat. His death, his impending death, would be a victory. Why worship a failed prophet? That's what she was doing. And and many times Jesus told his disciples what he was going to do. In fact, look at these verses with me. Go back to Mark 8, look down at verse number 31. Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and afterward three days arise again. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about, he looked on his disciples, and he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Here Jesus is saying, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die on the cross, I'm going to resurrect. And Peter said, Wait a minute, Lord, you're not going to do this. And and Jesus rebuked him and said, That's Satan speaking through you. Look in chapter 9, look down at verse 30. Chapter 9, verse 30. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it, And he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed. He shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. They still didn't get it. You're going to do what? You're going to die? Why is that? And they didn't want to ask him. Look at chapter 10, look down at verse 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, And Jesus went before them, and they were amazed as they followed, and they were afraid. And he took again the twelve, and he began to tell them what things should happen to him, saying, Behold, we go to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered into the chief priests, under the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and he shall deliver them to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. So he told them, They just couldn't seem to get it. They couldn't seem to comprehend it. And here in chapter 14, in just a little bit, he's going to have the Passover supper where he says, this bread is my body, which is broken, will be broken for you. This cup of the wine is my blood, which will be shed for many for you. They still didn't get that he was going to die, and the purpose of his death was to redeem them, John the Baptist introduced his whole ministry by saying, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Why did Jesus die? He didn't die as a martyr. He didn't die as a good example. There's all these different theories out there. Let me tell you why Jesus died. He died to take your sin debt. He fulfilled what the Bible said he needed to do in order to buy salvation for us. You see, God the Father is holy. He must judge sin. Every sin will be judged. But God is also a God of love. He doesn't want to judge you. So to satisfy the God the Father's holy demands, Jesus came to this earth, lived a perfect life, fulfilled all of the demands of the law. At the end of that life, he died on the cross. All of our sins were placed on Christ. 
all of your sins and my sins, and the wrath of God that should fall on me fell on Christ as my substitute, and he paid our sin debt. That's the redemptive work of Christ. Mary understood this was going to happen, and that's why she anointed him the way that she did with this expensive perfume because it was an act of worship and devotion for his redemptive work, which was yet to come. She knew he was going to die. She knew he was going to be buried. She knew he was going to rise again. By the way, she knew that because she watched Jesus resurrect her own brother, Lazarus. She knew he had power over death. She understood that. By doing this, she was treasuring the redemptive work of Christ. You know how we know we treasure Christ when we are obsessed with the cross and what he did for us? The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 6.14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul was obsessed by the cross of Christ, and so should we be. One time a teenage boy complained to his father. He said, I don't like the songs in church. They're kind of boring. And the father said, well, maybe you can write some new ones. And the boy took that up as a challenge. And he did write a song based on Galatians 6.14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. And he wrote these words, When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. That young man was Isaac Watts, who wrote many beautiful songs, none more beautiful than this, where he also said, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the depth of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. We treasure Christ when he's the central person of our life, when we cherish his redemptive work for us. But here's number three, when, we worship, when worshiping Christ is our ultimate priority. Look down at verse number four. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. This word indignation, it talks about a level of fury, of anger. They saw what Mary did, and they called it a waste. They saw this, and they thought, wow, we could have taken this this perfume, this cologne, we could have sold it for 300 denarii. A denarii was a, a, a day's wage, so 300 would be roughly a year's work, a year's wage. They worked six days in that time. They got paid each day. On the seventh day, they didn't get paid. So really, this is a year's wage. And they said, we could have sold this. And we could have put it in the money bag. And then we could have distributed it to the poor. Now, Mark's gospel doesn't tell us who this was that initiated this. But in John's parallel account, we know who said this. You know who it was? It was Judas. Judas is the one who murmured and caused the other disciples to get in an uproar against her. In fact, the word murmur here when it says they murmured against her, that's a vast understatement. It has the idea of being so angry that your nostrils flare. Judas was the one behind this whole thing. And you know what? He had no real interest in the poor. Listen to what John 12, 6 says. And he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So Judas was the treasurer of this group. He held the money bag, and John says, you know what? He was stealing out of that all the time for himself. He wasn't concerned about the poor. He was a thief. The only poor person he was worried about was himself. He was trying to get more money. And wow, this could have been sold for 300 denarii. I mean, Judas is looking at that and saying, man, I wish I could have gotten my hands on that money for this. He was a thief. He was a devil. All he wanted was the money. What a contrast here between the attitude of Judas and the attitude of this woman. He calls it, the disciples called it a waste. How could you say that you're wasting this on Jesus? Here this woman, she values it as worship. Judas is very bitter and angry. She's humble and loving. Judas is motivated by greed. She's motivated by gratitude. Judas is incredibly selfish She's very selfless. All she wanted to do was worship the Lord, and as an expression of her worship, she wanted to give lavishly 
to Jesus, and boy, did she ever. This word says it was an alabaster box. Really, it's, it was a, a, a bottle that had a long neck, a flask. I've seen these in the Holy Land. And uh, she wanted to do this as an act of devotion. She wanted to use this oil to anoint Jesus and give it to him as an act of worship. And remember I said worship at its root is just simply giving. When we come to God's house, we come not for what we can get, but for what we can give to the Lord. We give him of our praise from our tongue. We give him our time. We give him our treasure. All of that is an expression of our worship. And the greater the sacrifice, the greater the worship. David said, I will not offer anything that costs me nothing. I want whatever I give to God to cost me something because that shows the magnitude of my worship. Here this woman gives this, and by the way, women, they didn't have a lot of money back then. They didn't have work like a lot of the men did. To have this, and this was probably 12 ounces to 16 ounces worth of perfume and a year's worth. I mean, how could she get that? Where did it come from? This was probably a family heirloom that had been in the family for a long time. It was an incredible thing that she did. And notice how Jesus responds in verse 6. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She has wrought a good work on me. She's done excellently. She's done beautifully. Lavish love on Jesus is never a waste. Never a waste. And then he said this, you always have the poor with you. You're always going to have the poor. That's borrowed from Deuteronomy 15.11. Where Jesus says, where it says, you always have the poor of the land. And what's what's going on here? It's a simple principle, and that's this: adoring worship of Christ is the ultimate priority. That's the highest thing that we do. Nothing wrong with giving to the poor. We should give to the poor. In fact, we don't do it enough. But the ultimate priority is to worship Christ. And Jesus said, "You're going to have the poor with you, always." It's good to give to them, but in this special moment, her priorities are right. I will not always be here. Love is good. Charity is necessary, but worship, worshiping the true Christ is always better, and it always leads to more. We're glad you joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever-Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life and He wants you to live out every day of it for His ever-living story.